Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you all had a good weekend. So uh, just a quick reminder, uh, always make sure to check your CASA calendars as uh, there, I think, uh, there are a lot of uh, things that are due this week. Uh, let me just take a quick look. I guess uh, quiz number one is due on the 27th. And um, you need to schedule test one and take test one on the 29th together with the practice test and the poppers for week number two. And then on the 30th, quiz number two will be due. So I guess it's a, it's a pretty uh, busy week for you guys. But again, if you encountered some tough questions or if you have some difficulties or confusions with questions with the past or present poppers or homeworks, just let me know via the chat so we can discuss them in the lab. Or if it's a, if it's a quick question, probably I can answer you via chat or via email. Now, OK. Let me see. Um, OK, let me just uh, share my screen now. Um, I guess last week you talked about section 7.1, which is um, the uh, mean value theorem for integrals. But before um, answering some problems on that, maybe uh, I can entertain some some more questions if you have about um, about uh, review topics from um, from calculus one, perhaps uh, use substitution and so on. Uh, I also found a couple of interesting problems which we didn't have the chance to uh, discuss in the lecture last time. Uh, these were basically some questions I got from my other uh, lab class, so I'm thinking. This might be also of interest to you, but you didn't have time to uh, ask these questions. Uh, but just a quick uh, question. Can you guys see my screen? I am now starting to share um, uh, worksheet number two on the screen. Can you guys see it? I'm seeing just the Microsoft Teams display of all the, the logos. Yeah, let me see. That's also what I'm seeing on my laptop. Uh, let me. Uh-huh, but I guess the others are seeing it. Uh, let me just restart sharing my screen because I'm monitoring it via my laptop and I'm not seeing my screen or my tablet screen. But anyway, let me do it another time. Okay, let's see. Though I guess there's a bit of a lag, but yeah, there we go. Now I see my my uh, worksheet number two screen on uh, on my laptop. Uh, I hope you can see it now. All right. So as I mentioned, uh, I guess there are three problems here coming from a section uh, uh, coming on the coming from the topics on U substitution, which I would like to walk you through, guys. Though uh, I guess you have seen this in probably some of the homework problems, but you didn't have time to. Uh, to uh, ask me about this, but I'll just go through them quickly and just let me know if you want to know some more of the details here. Okay, again, this is still a use substitution. Uh, this is problem 42 from worksheet number one. So we need to find the integral of um, e to the x over e to the 2x plus 4. And again, I mentioned last time that uh, the first thing you can try for the for the substitution for the u function is the denominator, right? But unfortunately, here if you let u to be the denominator e to the two x plus four, then the du required would be e to the two x times two, right? But unfortunately, nowhere uh, there's nowhere we can get an e to the two x from the numerator, so that means it's not an appropriate uh, substitution, right? But for those cases. Um, you need to be uh, you need to uh, to uh, check the form of the integral and compare it with some other uh, some other um, formulas from our table. In particular, I guess this one uh, falls under the category of integrals yielding inverse uh, trigonometric functions. So if you remember the formulas for um, for uh, integrals that will yield arc sine, arc tan, or arc um, arc secant. So maybe I can put that down here. So first we recall that uh, the integral of du over a squared plus u squared 
equals one over a arctangent of u over a plus c, right? Again, the, the trick of letting u to be the denominator won't work here. We can't get the appropriate uh, du. So I suggest the next step is to see if the denominator or the integral falls under uh, the form of the integral shielding inverse uh, trigonometric function. So for instance, in this case, I, I, um, I noticed that this integral fall, falls under the form du over a squared plus u squared. We're in, um, we're in, I can take a squared to be equal to four and u squared to be uh, e to the two x and try to use a u substitution that will lead me into this nice form, right? So that means, so here we want to have u squared equals e to the two x and a squared equals four. That's our goal, right? Or let's see if this will work. So basically here, if I'll say that I want u squared to be equal to e to the two x, then I must let u to be equal to e to the x, right? I just took the square root of both sides here. So if I let u to be equal to e to the two x, I should also have a differential, right? So I should compute for du to see if this substitution uh, work will, will, uh, will, um, will be appropriate. So du would be e to the two x dx. And luckily we have e to the uh, x dx coming from the original integral. So I guess this is the right substitution. So here we, so we have the integral of e to the x over e to the two x plus four dx will be equal to, okay, e to the x dx will be replaced by du over, I can write four as two squared plus u squared, right? And now I can apply the formula that I have just written after the integral. So this is one over two arctangent of uh, u over two plus the arbitrary constant c, right? Remember that a squared equals four, so a equals two. And then the last step is to revert to the original variable. So I'm gonna have one half arctangent of e to the x all over two plus the arbitrary constant c. Okay, so I hope that's fine. Let me know if you have questions. Uh, if none, I'll go to problem 49. Again, uh, so you have uh, the integral of four arcan 5x all over one plus 25x squared. So you see here that though you have very similar forms for the integrals, but they may lead to different solutions. So for instance here, oh, I see that if I let u to be equal to the entire denominator, one plus 25x squared, I will have a big problem because uh, yeah, the required du then will be equal to 50x, uh, which is nowhere to be found in the numerator. And more importantly, I have a bigger problem in the numerator, I have an arctangent function. So I cannot let u to be equal to the denominator. And I guess it will, it will not also be uh, helpful to look at it as an integral yielding inverse string functions, because though the denominator will work um, uh, looks like the form needed for an integral yielding uh, the arctan function, say a equals one and u squared equals 25 x squared. But the bigger problem here is we have, an, we have a four arctangent five x in the numerator. But luckily, if you try to let u to be that more complicated function, I mean, if I let u to be equal to arctangent of five x, then let's see what would, it, what would be the required du. Well, that will give us du equals one over one plus five x quantity squared dx, right? Or you can write it as dx over one plus 25 x squared, which is something that we already have in the integral. So that dx over one plus 25 x squared can be rewritten as du, and then the arctan will just be replaced by u. So that means this integral over here is just equal to four times u du, right? Which is a very elementary form. And then if you integrate this, this will be four u squared over two 
plus the arbitrary constant C. We can simplify a bit, write it as 2u squared plus C, and then revert to the original variable. We'll have 2, then R tangent of 5x quantity squared plus the arbitrary constant C. All right. So you see that though the uh, problems 42 and 49, or at least their denominators, have similar forms, but the solutions uh, vary because of their very different numerators. So be careful about these substitution rules. And then, uh, huh? if that's fine, I want to end uh, our review of U substitution by problem F. Remember, I'm using letters for uh, for problems that are not uh, coming from the worksheet uh, from the previous worksheet, but something that we made out of the of the fly. So here, um, this is another example that the denominator is not a good choice for the u, because if we let u to be equal to 100 minus x to the fourth, that will require a negative 4x cubed as in the du, or, uh, yeah, in the du, but that is nowhere to be found in the numerator. And here, I guess the the strategy is to compare it with another integral yielding inverse trig functions. So if you recall. The integral of du over the square root of a squared minus u squared is equal to arc sine of u over a plus c, right? And I see this because I remember that at least um, uh, if I have a constant squared minus something squared or a power, an even power, then it is sort of um, related to the arc sine function. So true enough here, I can take a squared to be 100, right? And then x to the 4 to be my u squared and see if this substitution will work. So here we want a squared to be 100, right? That means we can take a equals 10. And we want u squared to be x to the 4, right? Let me just erase this. So. And then if u squared equals x to the fourth, then I can try letting u to be equal to x squared and see if that will be a good substitution. Uh, and true enough, du then will be just 2x dx. And here, I already have a 2x, uh, I have a dx, I have an x, though I have an extra 6, but I can multiply both sides here by 3 to get 3 du equals 6x dx. So I know that that 6x dx coming from the original integral can be replaced by 3 du. So eventually here, I can write the original integral as simply, so 6x dx will be replaced by 3 du all over square root of 10 squared minus u squared, right? Then I can simply apply the formula for the arc for the integral yielding the inverse sine function. So this would be three because of the constant three inside the integral. Then arc sine of u over 10 plus the arbitrary constant c. And then we revert to the original variable. So we're going to get three arc sine of x squared over 10 plus the arbitrary constant c. OK, so uh, yeah, this is just what I want to add today to our discussion from last week. Uh, some use substitution techniques might be coming from integral shielding inverse trigonometric functions. All right, so add them to your uh, list of checkpoints for the use substitution. All right, so uh, any questions about this, guys, or anything related about sex, uh, about use substitution? Uh, okay, Fallon, uh, do you have a question? Go ahead. Yes, um, where did you get the three from? Like, oh, wait, sorry. Um, oh, wait, sorry, I just got a little confused. Um, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, you're asking about this three over here? No, at the top where you went from d uh, equals yeah. x, x to 3d equals mm -hmm. 6. Okay. So if you go back to my u substitution, I let u to be equal to x squared, right? And then I computed the, de the derivative of both sides. So I got du equals 2x dx, all right? 
But I noticed that in the original integral, I just don't have a 2x, I have a 6x. So I'm thinking what would be the replacement for 6x dx, knowing that du equals 2x dx. So I want to get a substitution for 6x dx, and I noticed, oh, I, I will get an expression for 6x dx if I multiply both sides of this equation by 3. So if you multiply both sides of the equation by 3, you'll get 3 du is equal to 6x dx. And that gives me the perfect substitution for the numerator. So instead of a 6x dx, I replace it by 3 du, because from my u substitution, I knew that du is equal to 2x dx. Uh, I hope that clears things up. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Or another way you can do this is, uh, well, probably this might sometimes be better. Um, yeah, sure, Nadia, you can ask questions about practice test one. Just uh, send me your questions there. Uh, another way of looking at this is via this. You can divide both sides by the constant. So you get, oops, sorry. Yeah, so here you can write this as du over 2 equals x dx. Okay, and probably this might be easier. So if you know that x dx will be replaced by du over 2. So this guy, all right, would be 6 times x dx, but x dx can be written as du over 2. But essentially, that will again be 3 du, which is the same thing that we would get. So it's up to you which one would be easier for you. Follow uh, what they did in the original solution or do the orange uh, alternative uh, substitution for x dx. Okay. So there are um, more than one ways to answer a problem. So uh, pick the more convenient to you. Okay, I see uh, there is a question from Nadia in the chat. Uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, this is a question uh, coming from, uh, I guess, one of the earlier uh, sections of chapter six from Cal one. But let's, uh, yeah, we can go over it quickly. Okay, her question is um, find f inverse prime of 7 pi over 2 given that f of x equals 7x plus 4 cosine x. All right, so in this particular problem, mm -hmm, okay, so we need to find the derivative of the inverse. The long way to answer this is to find the inverse of 7x plus 4 cosine x and find the derivative, but that might that will not be easy. So we need to apply one of the formulas uh, that were given from uh, from Cal one. So maybe you can recall that f inverse uh, prime of b is equal to one over f prime of a, where f of a is equal to b. Okay. So if I do that here, then I need to know two things. First, I need to find f prime and evaluate it at the number a, which is fine because we were given how f looks like. So from there, uh, I can solve for f prime of x is equal to seven plus, uh, this would be minus, minus four sine x, right? And then I need to plug in a, but unfortunately I don't know a at this moment. All I know is that 7a should be, uh, sorry, f of a is equal to b. Now in this case, our b is the number inside f inverse prime. So if you compare these formulas, b will correspond to 7 pi over 2. So that means I'm looking for a. Such that... Um, f of a is equal to 7 pi over 2. Okay, now this will not be, uh, I don't think uh, there's an easy way to solve this algebraically, but if you plug in a, I can have uh, 7a plus 4 cosine a should be equal to 7 pi over 2. And then, 
Well, what would be a nice answer to this? Um, if you have an odd, uh, if you have an odd multiple of pi over two, what would be the cosine? If you go back to the unit circle, cosine of pi over two is equal to zero. Cosine of three pi over two is equal to zero. Cosine of seven pi over two is uh, zero. And uh, cosine of seven pi over two is also equal to zero. So I guess here I can note that cosine of seven pi over two is equal to, or actually, hmm, yeah, maybe I can just uh, do pi over two, right? So it's a little bit tricky to find that number A, which we need to plug in into F prime, okay? So now I notice that, okay, cosine of seven pi over two will be equal to zero, right? Actually, this will be true for any odd multiple of pi over two, but I guess you will see later why I chose pi over two so is that right? Yeah, cosine pi over two is equal to zero. So that means if I plug that in into here, if I choose a equals pi over two, this guy will be zero. So we'll be left with seven times a. My candidate is pi over two. And luckily that will give me seven pi over two, right? So I can take a to be equal to pi over two. Again, the reason why this is true, if you plug in a equals pi over two in this equation, then that will be true, right? So, but how do I get pi over two as my candidate? I just noted that uh, any odd multiple of pi over two, <coughs> uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, any odd multiple of pi over two will give me cosine equal to zero. So that's the easiest way so that the second term will vanish. And the odd multiple of pi over two, when multiplied to seven, that will give me seven pi over two is pi over two. So using this info, I know that F inverse prime of seven pi over two is equal to one over F prime of pi over two. And I know that, uh, I know what F prime of pi over two is. It's seven minus four sine of X. I plug in pi over two. And then what is sine of pi over two? That's one. So I guess this is one third. Yeah, that's a little bit of a hard problem. And I guess the hardest part here is to determine the number A, which we need to plug in into F prime. So I hope that helps and that uh, that gave you a quick uh, review of this, uh, this topics, this formulas that came from chapter, uh, from the previous chapter of Cal 1. Okay. Uh, I guess somebody's raising his or her hand. Uh, yeah, go ahead, whoever that is. I can't find who raised his hand. Arsalan, yeah. Any question? Uh, can you go all the way up to the first question real quick? Have okay, it. sure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, isn't the formula supposed to be so when you the part where you recall? Isn't it supposed to be a square root over there? <coughs> um, square root. Um, uh, th this is for uh, for R10. For R10, there are no square roots involved. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, uh, the square roots only occur if you have arc sine and arc secant. And of course, arc cosine and arc cosecant. But for arc tangent, there's no square root needed in the denominator. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, that's a good point. Um, at this point, you should uh, recall all of the um, all of the uh, formulas because uh, you will be given a lot more formulas for the succeeding chapters. So I hope you guys start uh, uh, reviewing these things. Yeah, Josh, yeah, I can go back there. OK, so in this problem, uh, so uh, yeah, let me uh, walk you through over this problem again. Okay, so this is the formula that I want to use. Okay, because this relates the derivative of the inverse to the derivative of the given function, right? So here the requirement is that the number inside the derivative of the inverse must be your number b, and the number you need to plug in 
into the right hand side of the formula is a number a such that f of a is equal to b right so that's a requirement so we know b from the problem b is 7 pi over 2 so that means if i plug in a number i need to look for the number a when plugged in into the function f will give me 7 pi over 2 that's why i'm looking for an a such that this equation holds true okay now the case the thing here is if i plug in a into the left side i'll get this convoluted nonlinear equation here right equals 7 pi over 2 and it's quite hard to compute it algebraically so i need to use a little bit of a trick here and just do an intuitive check on what would be the nice candidates for a this is a this is a um Cal one, pro, uh, Cal 1 or Cal 2 problem, so it shouldn't be that hard. So I'm thinking, what are the possible nice candidates for the number A? Well, I just recalled going back to the unit circle, any odd multiple of pi over 2 will make cosine equal to 0. So that would be my viable choices so that the equation will simplify. So again, if you plug in an odd multiple of pi over 2 into cosine, you get 0, like cosine pi over 2 is 0, cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0, cosine of 5 pi over 2 is 0, cosine of 7 pi over 2 is 0, right? So if I use those numbers, then this guy will always be 0. So my equation will just be 7a equals 7 pi over 2. So that reduces the thing I need to solve to looking for what is the odd multiple of pi over 2 when multiplied to 7 will give me 7 pi over 2. So luckily there is one, and that's pi over 2. But yeah, I know the problem will boil down to such a simple equation because this is a Cal 1, Cal 2 uh, classroom problem. Otherwise, it would be difficult really to solve f of a equals 7 pi over 2. All right. But this is just an intuitive trick. And you are guaranteed to find such a simple trick for classroom problems in Cal 1 or Cal 2. But in general, this might not work. Mm -hmm. And we're just lucky that the problem allows us to use that trick. All right. OK, so good. Uh, let's go quickly to uh, section 7.1 if you don't have any other problems or questions. So section 7.1 is about the mean value theorem for integrals. Remember when we talk about derivatives from Cal 1, we introduced there a version of the mean value theorem, but that regards the derivative of a certain function. But there's a version of the mean value theorem. Actually, there are two versions of the mean value theorems for integrals. And let me uh, state them quickly here, just a quick review. I guess you did this in the lecture last time. So, um, okay. So if your function is continuous on the closed interval AB, or that's one thing about me, and I think some of my previous students know this, I love mathematical notations, just as a sort of a shorthand for things that I need to write. So uh, this means F, is continuous that's what that's what i use the uh, curly c for so the curly c means continuous over the closed interval a b so that statement here means f is a continuous function on the closed interval a b so if that is true then there exists so this uh mirrored letter E sort of is the mathematical symbol for there exists. So maybe I should write that down here if you haven't um, encountered this symbol before. So then there exists a number C on the open interval AB such that uh, the integral of um, f of x uh, dx times 1 over b minus a is equal to f of c, right? Or maybe it's better to write it this way. Hold on. Uh, and then let me just center this. There we go. So the mean value theorem for integral says that if your function is continuous on a closed interval a, b, then there will exist, you are guaranteed to find at least a number c on the open interval a, b, such that f of c equals 1 over b minus a 
times the integral of f of x dx. And there is an important thing about this guy, the right hand side. This is called the mean value, the mean or the average value of f over the interval a, b. Okay, so basically what the mean value theorem tells us that uh, over an interval a, b, you can find a number c at which the function attains the average value, right? So there is always a number c in the on the open interval where the function attains its average value, right? And then I guess there's a second version of the mean value theorem that involves functions f and g, though they are not usually used at this point. It would be useful uh, when we go to uh, finding the center of mass of a certain object. So I might as well skip that uh, second version of the MVT unless we will need them along the way. But I want you guys to focus on this statement of the mean value theorem. So the only requirement is that your function be continuous. And then you are guaranteed always to find a number C at which the function will attain its average value. And then the average value of your function is one over B minus A times the integral of F of X DX from A to B, right? So usually, or sometimes we call, we, call, we also call this number F sub AV to stand for F, uh, the average value of the function F, all right? So let's try to answer some problems involving the mean value theorem. Oh, one thing about the mean value theorem, it tells us the existence of C. It guarantees that there will always be a number C, but it's quite limited in the sense that it doesn't tell us how many number Cs there are. There could be more than one number C on a closed interval A, B that satisfies this equation. Let's label this equation star, right? And aside from being silent on the number of uh, C's on the open interval AB that satisfies equation star, the mean value theorem also doesn't tell us anything about that number C. So we really need to compute that number C manually. All the MVT says is there exists, but it's silent uh, as to how many and what are those numbers C, okay? So just a quick examples of um, problems involving MVT, so okay. So I guess I have three functions here, and the challenge for us is to find the average value of the following functions and find a point on this interval at which the function takes on the average value, right? Okay, let's go to problem number one. F of x equals two cosine x over the interval zero to pi. Well, note that uh, F is continuous on the close interval zero to pi. So by MVT, we're sure that there exists a C on the open interval zero pi, such that F of C equals one over the length of the interval, right? That's B minus A. So the length of the given interval is pi, that's pi minus zero. If you want, you can also include that here, times the integral, from zero to pi of the function dx, right? So this is what the MVT tells us, right? And this is also the average value. So there is a number C on the open interval zero pi such that this equation is true. Now let's evaluate this integral to find the absolute, uh, the, to find the average value. So this is one over pi times the integral of two cosine x is what? Uh, two, sine x, right? Evaluated from zero to pi. And here we get one over pi. And then I use the, uh, the first fundamental theorem of calculus, part two, in order to evaluate the definite integral. So this would be two sine pi minus two sine zero. And what would be this value? This would be one over pi sine of pi is zero, sine of zero is zero, so that would be zero, okay? And this is the average value. So that answers our first question. The average value of two cosine x over zero to pi is zero. Maybe I can highlight this last statement. 
So that's our answer for the first question. What's the average value? And then the other question is, what is the number C that satisfies this? So we want to solve C such that F of C equals the average value, which is zero. Then we plug in C into the definition of F. We get two cosine C equals zero, and we need to solve this over the interval zero to pi, right? Because remember, the guarantee of the MVT is limited on the open interval zero to pi. So that means cosine C is equal to zero. And what are the C values from zero to pi at which cosine is equal to zero? I guess there's only one, and that's pi over two, right? So uh, to recap here, we have found that uh, the average value of the function over the interval zero to pi is zero, and that average value is attained when C is equal to pi over two. Good? That's an easy one. Uh, any questions, guys, about that? It seems that you all fell silent in the chat. Is this okay? Or is that too easy? Remember, I always want to start easy just to illustrate the point. So let's uh, take it a notch higher uh, if you don't have any questions. Uh, problem number two, what if the function f is uh, the absolute value function and we want to get the average value from negative four to four? Right. So uh, you can also phrase your statement this way. So we want to find the average value. The average value, again, as we have defined earlier, is one over the length of the interval. Here, the interval is negative four to four, so the length is eight, right? Or if you want to solve it uh, analytically, you can write B minus A, so that's four minus negative four, right? Upper bound minus lower bound times the integral from negative four to four of the absolute value of x dx, all right? So this would be 1 8 integral from negative 4 to 4 of the absolute value of x dx. And then I hope you still remember how to evaluate the absolute value, uh, the integral of an absolute value function. Uh, you, can, you can do it uh, in one of two ways. The first one is to uh, to um, split this integral up into two pieces, one from negative four to zero and the other one from zero to four and evaluate them independently. Or you can use the fact that uh, the absolute value function is symmetric with, with respect to x equals zero, right? Uh, which one do you wanna use? You wanna wa do you want the shorter one or the longer one? I guess if you don't have any preference, maybe I'll go for the shorter one. Uh, I want both. OK, sure. Uh, I'll start with splitting it up, so uh, following her some suggestions. So you can think of it as 1 8 times the integral from negative 4 to 4 dx, oh, sorry, negative 4 to 0, plus the integral from 0 to 4 of dx. I knew how to. Uh, I knew that uh, I would uh, split this into two pieces, because from negative four to zero, the absolute value of x is equal to negative x, and from zero to four, the absolute value of x is simply x itself. I hope you guys remember that, right? So the absolute value of a negative number is its negative, so that you have a negative by negative, it becomes positive, and the absolute value of a positive number is simply itself. Okay. Now we evaluate them separately. So we have negative, uh, we have one eight outside times the integral of negative x is negative x squared over two, evaluated from negative four to zero plus uh, x squared over two, but evaluated from zero to four. And then this would be what? This would be one eight times uh, I plug in zero, so I'll have zero minus negative two, I guess. Is that right? I plug in negative four, so I, I'll have uh, not negative two, negative four quantity squared is 16, so that should be eight. That good? Uh, negative four squared is 16 over two, that's eight. But there's a negative sign in front, and then there's a negative, I guess that's right plus x squared over two evaluated from zero to four, so that's gonna be eight 
minus zero. So this would be one eight times 16. So that's 16 over eight, and that's equal to two. So that's the long solution um, for the integral from negative four to four of the absolute value of X, but essentially we get the uh, average value to be equal to two. Let me just insert a page uh, so that I can show you the alternative solution, um, which is the shorter one. Okay, alternative, uh, alternatively, you can do it this way. So remember, we're looking for the average value of the function. So this would be one over eight, integral from negative four to four, absolute value of x dx. But if you remember the graph of the absolute value function, it is symmetric uh, at x equals zero. Uh, hold on, that's a bit weird. Can you guys uh, see my screen? I already started writing the alternative solution. Though in my monitor, it doesn't appear that way. Uh, hold on, let me see. Hello, guys. Uh, I think I have some internet problem. Uh, is my screen also stuck with you? Yeah, we can't, we can't see the new page that you made. Okay, let me again restart sharing my screen. Yeah, MS seems again, uh, I guess it's acting weird, but anyway, let me uh, start broadcasting again. Okay, there we go. So uh, if you remember the graph of the absolute value function is just a V-shaped graph that is symmetric with respect to x equals zero. That means the area here is equal to the area over here, as long as the intervals are the same. So we are interested from negative four until four. So an alternative solution here is that, okay, I'll have one eight coming from the problem, but I can simply evaluate the integral from zero to four of the absolute value of x dx. So meaning I'm just evaluating the area shaded, uh, the area of the region shaded yellow, but uh, I need to multiply it by two using symmetry, right? And if I do this, I'll have a one fourth integral from zero to four of, but now I'm only dealing with positive numbers, integral from zero to four. Over the interval zero to four, the absolute value function is simply itself, right? Or the absolute value of x is just equal to itself. And so I can continue the solution this way. I got one fourth times x squared over two evaluated from zero to four. And this would be one fourth times 16 over two. And this will just be equal to two. The same value we got before, right? So here we see that the average value indeed is equal to two. Right, but a, a much shorter solution. Uh, the key here is that I took advantage of the symmetry of uh, the given function. All right. But if you do any of the two uh, steps, you get the same answer, so it doesn't matter too much. Now, the uh, follow up question is find a value of C. So we, we want to find C, but just on the interval negative four to four such that f of c is equal to two, right? But the absolute uh, f of c, the function given is what? Absolute value function. So we're looking for the solution of f of c equals two. And what are the solutions here? Do you guys remember? What's the solution for c? Come on guys, don't be shy. <laughs> What are the values for C? Okay, great. Thank you, Muriel. Uh, that C equals plus or minus two. Because the absolute value of two is two, the absolute value of negative two is two, and both numbers, plus or minus two, are on the open interval negative four to four. If in solving for the number C, you get the number outside of the given open interval, then you need to discard those, right? 
So, but luckily here I have C equals plus or minus two. All right. Now, uh, I hope that's clear. I have another question here, uh, but uh, this is, um, I guess this is easy. The only complication here is that it involves the parameter M and the parameter A, but you can do the same steps carefully as what I did in problems one and two. The only difference here is that you need to treat the letters M and A to be constants, right? So nothing fancy about this. Uh, if we have time, I can go back to this problem, but I want to go and solve some of the problems coming here from part B. So I hope that's okay uh, since we only have five minutes left. So I'll skip number three and then leave that guys to you. But don't worry, I'll include the problem three in the annotated worksheet that I will upload, or perhaps even better, we can go over it on uh, Wednesday as we start uh, the class. Because I want to answer some problems from part B. I hope that's fine. So let's go to problem four. So for problem four, given that the average value of f on the interval one, four is five, find the integral of six f of x dx from one to four. Again, here for solving problems like this, you can first uh, digest what are the given information and then use some properties of integrals in order to solve the given uh, to solve a given problem, right? So if you go back to the question, uh, the information given is that the average value of f on the interval one, four is five. So that translate mathematically. So to this, f of a is equal to five. And we know that the formula for the average value is one over the length of the interval. The length of one to four is three, right? That's four minus one integral of f of x dx from one to four, okay? So basically this tells us that the integral from one to four of f of x dx is equal to 15, good? But what are we asked for? We are asked for the integral from one to four of six f of x dx. So I'm solving for that. I'll use a property of integrals that tells me that I can take out the constant factor. Okay. And then, oh, I know what the integral from one to four of f of x dx is, that's equal to 15. So I have this. The answer is 80. How do we get 15? Uh, the average value is five, so that's equal to this. Then I multiplied both sides by three in order to get rid of the fraction in front. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, clear, Yasosa? Right, so I multiplied both sides of F of A by three. Okay, so you need to manipulate the given information to come up with uh, some useful information to solve the problem, right? And I hope the next uh, step is clear. All right. Now let's try another one. Problem five, and we'll stop here. Given that the average value of an even function f on zero three is two, find the integral from negative three to three of f of x dx. Here we need to quickly recall what an even function is. A function is even. if f of x is equal to f of negative x. So that's the requirement for f to be even, right? So what are what would be the given information? What are the given info in the problem? So from the problem, we know that the average value of the even function f is two. So that means f of a is equal to two, but the formula for the average value is one over the length of the interval then integral over the interval of the given function, f of x dx. So this tells us I can multiply both sides by three. So I know that the integral from zero to three of f of x dx is equal to six. Good. But we are looking for the integral from negative three to three of f of x dx. 
Well, the long way to solve this is here. So I can split this integral up into two pieces. Integral from negative three to three, uh, sorry, negative three to zero of f of x dx plus integral from zero to three of f of x dx. But I already know that the second term is equal to six, right? Maybe I can put this down. Okay, now we need to evaluate this integral here. Okay, but on that integral, on the remaining integral, I can let u to be equal to negative x, okay? Then du would be equal to negative dx. Uh, I'm doing this so that I can take advantage of the definition of uh, an even function, right? So if I do the substitution, then the integral from negative three to zero of f of x dx is equal to f of negative u, negative du, and then the bounds would be, uh, huh, this would be from three to zero, right? So remember, I need to change the bounds. I let u to be equal to negative x. This is my x value. So the corresponding u value is three, and then zero is still zero over there. But here I will have negative integral from three to zero of f of negative u du, right? And then I can reverse the order of integration. From three to zero, I can write it as zero to three, but at the cost of negative sign, but that negative sign will be canceled by the negative sign there. So it will be a positive number, f of negative u du, right? But remember, f is even, so f of negative u is also equal to f of u, du since f is even. Right. And but remember, uh, integral from zero to three of f of u du would be the same as the integral from zero to three of f of x dx. I can just uh, replace all x, uh, all u I z I see by u. Right. So if you see here, I can replace all u I see by the variable x. That's perfectly fine. Oh, but anyway, I already know what the value of the integral from zero to uh, zero to three of f of x dx is. This is equal to six, right? So therefore, we know that the integral from negative three to three of f of x dx is equal to 12. So that's a long solution. The shorter one is just noting the fact that all even functions are symmetric with respect to x equals zero. So whatever the value, from zero to three is uh, will also be the value from negative three to zero. That's the same principle we applied to the absolute value function uh, we solved earlier, right? Because the absolute value function is an example of an even function. But in this case, I just went through the details just in case you didn't uh, uh, notice the symmetry. So this is a perfectly fine long solution, but it's also uh, better if you recognize the symmetry and just say that, oh, it's an even function. So the integral from negative three to three will just be twice the integral from zero to three. OK. I guess I'm going over time here. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we're over by five minutes. I guess there's still um, three questions left in this worksheet. Uh, I have uh, we have two options here either. I can um, include the solutions to these problems in the annotated worksheet that I, I will upload today, or we can discuss them on Wednesday, first thing on Wednesday. What do you guys prefer? Should I just include the solution to the annotated worksheet and then it's for you to uh, to read the solution, or you want to discuss them on Wednesday? Because on Wednesday, we will start talking about examples from 7.2 and 7.3. OK, so it seems uh, yeah, I'm also amenable to that. So let's just discuss them on Wednesday and then just let me know because I know that I kind of rushed these the uh, discussion to the last questions because I know we're running short on time. But yeah, sure, let's uh, 
let's uh, do this on Wednesday, the rest of the worksheet. And let me know if you have questions or difficulties about the last uh, problems that we solved today. All right. So, OK, guys, uh, I guess uh, we'll stop here. I hope you have a good day and see you again on Wednesday. Bye.